secret to living your best life wasn't somewhere out there. But what if we consider together that the secret to living our best life is somewhere a little closer to home? What if the key to living our best life, you living your best life and me living my best life, is simply found in slowing down? Slowing down enough so that the world around us becomes less blurry and more in focus. What if, what if, what if the answer to what we're all searching for is a pace of life that matches our energy rather than others' expectation? When we consider this whole idea of living our best life, there is this one moment in Scripture. This one moment in Scripture that literally leaps off the page. It's the words of Jesus. And he says this in Matthew chapter 11. He says, come to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And let's all breathe A long exhale. I will give you rest. I found it. The verse continues. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle, humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Not rest for your bodies but rest for your souls. You would think after 25 microphones, I'd find one that doesn't do that. And then he concludes this statement by saying, my yoke, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And all of God's people say, amen. And somehow when we read those words, we just breathe in deep and then breathe a big sigh of relief. And I think if we're all being honest with one another, that just simply sounds amazing, doesn't it? The idea of all of that, rest for our souls, rest from God, having an easy burden to life, that all just sounds amazing like heaven on earth, doesn't it? Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle, humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But the tension... And as great as that sounds to each and every one of us, is that that requires work. (laughs) As counterintuitive as it sounds, the idea of rest for all of us requires us to work for it. And then we have other responsibilities, don't we? There are family members to care for. There are kids to take to game after game after game, after game. We have demanding jobs, demanding teachers, demanding kids, 
demanding spouses. Can I get a good amen? Amen. (laughs) And let me just say, this is not going to be a one-size-fits-all sermon series. This is probably going to be one of those where you chew the meat and spit out the bones. There won't be... Uh, there won't be application on all of this for everybody, but I hope, I hope that you can find one thing to walk away with. In fact, I probably couldn't even do this whole topic justice in just a few weeks, but I really do hope that we can, we can walk away even weekly after our time together with one next step that we can, that we can apply to live our best life now. Are you with me, church? And the thing, the thing that's keeping all of us from living our best life, it may actually surprise us. It's probably not what we all think it is. In fact, I would even boldly submit that the thing that is keeping you from living your best life is not some incredibly big sin that you're struggling with. That may exist for you, but that's probably not what's keeping you from living your best life. For most of us, and maybe even for all of us, it's busy. It's busyness. It's hurry. It's an unsustainable lifestyle that leaves us less fulfilled when we're really pursuing fulfilledness. In his brilliant book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, Pastor John Mark Comer writes these words Satan doesn't show up as a demon with a pitchfork in a gravelly smoker voice or as Will Ferrell with an electric guitar and fire on Saturday Night Live. He writes, he's far more intelligent than we give him credit for. Today, he writes, you are far more likely to run into the enemy in the form of an alert on your phone while you're reading your Bible, or a multi-day Netflix binge, or a full-on dopamine addiction to Instagram or a Saturday morning at the office, or another soccer game on a Sunday, or commitment after commitment after commitment in a life of speed. When I read those words, I was convicted because that describes me to a T, and maybe for some of you as well. It just resonates with us, doesn't it? And if we're being honest, so many of us, we have an over-dependence on activity. We have an overdependence on activity, busyness, hurry, activity, always doing something and never slowing down. I love the definition that one pastor gave to hurry. He said, hurry is a state of frantic effort that one falls into in response to inadequacy, fear, and guilt. And that boils it down, doesn't it? A life of hurry is not what it's made out to be. A life of always being busy is often covering over some inadequacy, some fear, or some guilt that we experience regularly. The words of Psalm 23, they do not say, the Lord is my shepherd, so I must work more. The Lord is my shepherd, I must run faster. The Lord is my shepherd, I must add more things to my already overflowing plate. No, it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. And how often we try to get more. We try to hurry and hustle and accumulate and gather and earn and get. When scripture tells us, if the Lord is your shepherd, You lack nothing. Now let me just say, there are seasons and times where our plates are full of things that matter. And that's okay. They may not be bad times for us. The issue is that there is a definite line where we go from a full plate to an overflowing plate. And the only way to keep up with an overflowing plate is to run faster, to pick up more, to hurry, to get busy. And busyness and hurry is not a Christian way of life. Say that, Pastor. I can amen myself if I need to. Hurry and busyness are not a Christian way of life. In fact, if I can be bold, I would say that busyness and hurry are anti-Christian. I can prove it to you in just one simple question. 
Why is it that we don't serve more or give more or even love more? We simply don't have the time. Am I preaching to anybody today? Because I'm preaching to myself. Now, Jesus was busy. No denying that. Jesus was busy. I don't think anybody can argue with that, but he wasn't so busy. He wasn't so busy that he missed out on the most important parts of life. Those being love, presence, compassion, and disciple making. He was busy, but he did not miss out on the parts of our lives that are meaningful and that matter the most. And all of those, love, presence, compassion, and disciple making, guess what? You cannot hurry through any of them. I cannot hurry through loving my wife. I have to take time. Guess what? If time is her love language, i got to take even more time. Ain't that right, Noel? Sometimes it's Noel that needs my time. Because <laughs> that's his love language. I can't hurry my love. Listen, listen, for me to be present for my kids, I can't hurry through that. To be present means to take time. To be present means that I have to be there in the most meaningful moments of their lives. To be present means that I have to put things that I want aside for the things that they need. I cannot hurry through compassion Man, it has been an awakening I've been going through for the last few years. I've shared off and on about uh, my growing love of the homeless. And you know, I have discovered through others' examples and through what I read in Scripture that it is no longer sufficient for me to simply roll down my window and hand a $20 bill to a homeless man. No, what I need to do, roll down my window, hand the man a $20 bill, and then ask him his name. And then follow that up with how can I pray for you? Because compassion takes time. Daryl and Allison and others are building a homeless ministry out of our church. And guess what the number one priority is? Consistency. Consistency is time. They have to go out each and every week. Why? Because it takes time to build the relationship in order to truly minister to people that need it the most. You cannot hurry compassion, my friends. And lastly, disciple making. You can't hurry it. What you'll do is you'll hurt some people along the way. If you try to hurry people rather than spend time with people who need to be discipled, listen to me, we have gotten this wrong. We see a person that needs to be discipled and we get them out off the platform. We sit them down. We put them in time out rather than taking the time, the messy time that's required to sit with them and eat with them and do life with them and disciple them in a way that matters and leads to a lifelong following of Jesus. Disciple making takes time. We cannot hurry those parts of the Christian life. Hurry and busyness are not Christian. They are anti-Christian. And T.S. Eliot says it the best. He said that people are distracted from distraction by distraction. Oh, that describes my life better than any other quote I've heard. People are distracted from distractions with distractions. And we are distracting our way into this meaningless Christianity that has no depth and lacks any relationship with Jesus. Woo! And so it leads us to the very, very big question. Why am I in a hurry to become someone that I don't even like? Why am I in a hurry to become someone that I don't even like? Someone that hurries and gets to the end of life, possibly accumulating all of the stuff and all of the things, but having no one beside my bed to love me and care for me in the last moments of life because I turned my back on all of them through hurry. And the words of Jesus ring true in this moment for us, church. He says, the enemy comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy, but I have come, Jesus says, that they, and that's us, may have life and have it to the full. 
have life to the full. And we've talked about this a number of times as a church, and I believe that that is the goal, at least the goal of this series, living my best life. It is through the lens of who Jesus is and what Jesus promised. And Jesus says if you're living your best life, your life will be full. And I don't know about you, but I want to be filled up with the life-giving resurrection power of Jesus Christ. That is my goal. The Korean-born German philosopher Byung-Chul Han, he ends his book, The Burnout Society, you may want to pick that one up, with a haunting observation about most of us in the Western world. He says, the Western world, they are too alive to die and too dead to live. Too alive to die and too dead to live. And if our goal, if our goal is to live our best life, we can choose to do the same things we've always done and get the same results we've always got, or or we can follow a new path. We can alter our expectations. We can pattern our life after Jesus. And that, my friends, is what it's going to take. Throughout this series, throughout the next few weeks together, I want to offer up four things to focus on, four steps that we can all take to slow down and experience life in the way that God intended. Is anybody with me? Does that sound good to anybody else? Because here's what's going to happen. I'm going to put the first one up on the screen, and you'll be like, nope, mm -mm, I'm out. (laughs) So I need you to commit right now before we go any further. (laughs) Ain't that always the pastor, making us commit to something before we know. We're starting a new ministry. Who's in? Yeah. And then we start the new ministry. Oh, that wasn't what I thought it was going to be. Here's the first one. Silence and solitude. Silence and solitude. It's the first practice to living our best life. Now, before we jump into this, it's important to get some perspective. And so to do that, I want to I revisit Jesus' words that we agreed was water to our thirsty souls. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle, humble of heart, and you will find rest for your very souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is life. Now, uh, is light. And now in these verses, you see this idea of a yoke. And for many of us, it may be, uh, it may be foreign to consider the idea of the yoke. And you know what a yoke is probably. Back in the day, they would yoke a couple of oxen together because they knew that two oxen yoke yoked together could pull more and do more than one oxen by itself. So the yoke attached them together. And so Jesus in this illustration, he's using the idea of a yoke and he says, take my yoke upon you. And I don't know that we slow down or we consider the word yoke very much, but I think it's applicable for what we're talking about today. Jesus is not talking about an actual yoke, but rather he's referring to the way of life and the way of Christianity that he was teaching. He's saying, the things that I'm instructing you to do, it's kind of like a yoke. And if you will yoke up to me, you will experience life to the full. You will find rest for your souls. What he's doing in this moment, listen up to me, church, it's an important thing to get. What he's doing in this moment is he's juxtaposing his way of life with the Pharisees of the day. Because what he's pointing out to his followers and his potential followers is that their yoke is heavy. Their yoke is full of rules. Their yoke is full of condemnation. Their yoke is full of ugliness. Their yoke is full of selfishness. But if you take my yoke on you, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. I'm trying to instruct you in a way that will give you freedom, that will give you life. And if you take on my yoke, you will live your best life ever. Are you with me? It's a yoke. It's going to take some work, but it ain't going to be like the work they're instructing you to do. You ain't going to be disappointed day after day, coming home tired. No, no, no. This kind of work, get your mind around you, around this. This kind of work is actually rest for your souls. You're going to have to work for it, but guess what? When you get it, you're going to rest. When you receive it, you ain't going to be tired. Get this, my yoke is easy, and oh, how hard we try to make Jesus' yoke. His yoke is easy, everybody. 
His yoke does not come with a lot of caveats and what ifs and this. His yoke is easy. His yoke is light. Listen to me, church. He wouldn't have said it if it ain't true. So let's take off the yoke of discontentment, the yoke of selfishness, the yoke of measuring up, the yoke of other people's expectations. Let's take off the yoke of religion that he's going to be preaching about tonight. Let's take off the yoke of all the restraints and all of the rules and all of the guidelines. And let's live according to the yoke of Jesus, which is easy and light. Oh, that's where I want to live, family. That's where I want to be found. I want to take on Jesus' yoke because it's easy. Now, let's move it to the next step because Jesus is saying, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. So then what do we do? Well, we've got to yoke up. We've got to learn from the master. We've got to understand what he did to do what he did. We've got to, we've got to understand the life that Jesus led because if we want to experience the life of Jesus, we must adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. If we want to experience the life of Jesus, we must adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. Matthew 4, 1, a familiar one we've preached on a few times. It says, then, then, after he was baptized, after he came out of the water, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, I want to introduce us to a new word today. David, I'm, I'm, I'll be all right today, I think. I hope that we can, we can assimilate this word into our vernacular, into our everyday language. It's a, it's a Greek word. It's the Greek word that's translated wilderness here in Matthew 4.1, uh, but it's the word aramos. Everybody say aramos. Aramos. I heard a little Spanish mix in there. Aramos. No, no, no. It's Greek. <laughs> so it's just aramos. Aramos. Aramos is the Greek word translated in several places uh, in different ways. Here we see wilderness. Other places we see desert. We see solitary place or place of solitude or the, 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 um, the private place. Aramos, say Aramos. The Holy Spirit led Jesus to an Aramos to be tempted by the devil. And I think we've, we've looked at this story, and maybe we've looked at it through the wrong lens for years. At least maybe I can admit that I've been tempted to do that. I've thought this, I've read this and thought, man, ain't that just like the devil? Ain't that just like the devil? He's going to wait. He's going to wait until we're in the Aramos, until we're out in the wilderness, till we're hot, smelly, stinking tired, hungry, right? Jesus fasted 40 days. Anybody ever done that? It ain't no joke. I haven't done it. Uh, <laughs> I've gotten to about 10 completely water fast. That ain't no joke. Ain't that just like the devil? Going to wait. He's going to stand back. It ain't after Jesus comes up out of the water. God speaks these prophetic words over his life when he's living in power and Holy Spirit's hovering over him. No, no, no. It's, it's when he's tired when he's out in the middle of nowhere, when he's all alone and isolated. Ain't that just like the devil? And we can say amen. Because some of us have been there, haven't we? We've been out there alone. We've been out there and we're hungry. Because we ain't opened our Bible for a minute. We out there and we're thirsty because we ain't spent any time with Jesus for a minute. We're out there and we're hot because we've been living in sin for a while. That's a whole other sermon. I might write that one down. The devil does do that. But listen to me, church. What if? What if? What if rather than viewing that moment through the lens of being a place of weakness, what if? What if that was actually a place of strength for Jesus? It's a new thought, isn't it? It's a brand new thought. I've probably even preached the opposite. It's a new thought. What if that that actually is a place of strength for him? That actually the Aramos is a place that we should go to be alone with God, to be energized by God, to experience God's power in a unique way. And when we're in the Aramos, somehow we find strength. What if, oh, this is a big one, what if we actually view fasting rather than a diet plan, rather than something pastor told us we have to do, rather than something that we really hate doing, what if we looked at it as a way to get power to fight back against the enemy? 
What if rather than the Aramos and the desert and the quiet places and the hungry places and the thirsty places, what if rather than thinking about those places as a place of weakness, what if we actually thought of them as a place of strength? Wouldn't that change everything? And I would submit to you that the Aramos, that your Aramos is a place you go to get strength. It's a place that you and I need to dwell in. It's a place where we need to find ourselves regularly. The Aramos is not a scary place. It is not a strength-zapping place. It is a strength-giving place, just alone with God. Solitude, the place where we go to be alone, just the two of us. I'm not going to sing, but I'm tempted. But solitude, to be clear, solitude is being alone, but it's not being lonely. Solitude is being alone, but not being lonely. We can't get that twisted. There's a great book called Celebration of Discipline. Uh, Read it. If you haven't read it yet, Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. It is a great book on spiritual disciplines. I just encourage it. Uh, Couldn't encourage it more if you've not read it. But he says in that book, he says loneliness, loneliness is inner emptiness. Loneliness is inner emptiness, but solitude is inner fulfillment. You see, when I make the call for all of us to find our Aramos, our place where we go to be alone with God, that quiet place, that private place, that desert wilderness, whatever you want to call it, I'm not calling you to a place of loneliness. I'm calling you to a place of inner fulfillment. I'm calling you to a place where you go to get filled up so that you can go to your job so that you can be married to your spouse, so that you can raise your kids, so that you can be a faithful employee, so that you can be a good husband, brother, father, sister, aunt, whatever your title is. Solitude is engagement. Isolation is escape. Solitude is safety. Isolation is dangerous. Solitude is how you open yourself up to God, but isolation is painting a target on your back for the tempter. Solitude is when you set aside a time to feed and water and nourish your soul. That's what solitude does for us. And that's how we grow into health and maturity. Isolation is where we crave those things, but by ourselves. And these quiet places, the uh, Aramos, they... They were a high priority for Jesus. There, there were times in his, in his uh, ministry where he prioritized solitude even over eating and drinking. I don't have time to unpack those with you, but you can find them. And making time to get alone with God and spend time with him is a non-negotiable. It was a non-negotiable on Jesus' schedule. It is a non-negotiable for our schedule. There were times when Jesus, he ministered to people when he wanted to get away, but he also went back when he was able to get away. Solitude was as important to Jesus as silence was. Silence. Silence, this idea of silence, so that was solitude. Silence is, is, is important to note. Silence is both internal and external. Silence is both internal and external. Silence is about quieting the noise around us, but it's also about quieting the noise inside of us. I don't know about you, but my mind, it goes and goes and goes. I think about things like squirrels and the worship team shoes and all kinds of random things. That hard conversation I had to have with that person last week. That time that I had to fire somebody. That time when I let people down. Does anybody else rehearse moments like that in your mind? And the mind never shuts off all of my to-do lists, all of the things I need to get done, like a new backsplash in my kitchen. Thanks for that peer pressure to get that done my mind it goes and goes and goes and it hardly shuts off and because of that this whole idea of silence it is intimidating to me maybe it is for you in fact for many of us we use external noise to drown out the internal noise that's why when we get in the car first thing we turn on the radio Or when we get home, we flip on the TV or we say, hey, Alexa, play salsa music. I'm not going to dance either. That's why we pop in the podcast or the books into our ears that we listen to day after day after day. It's because we're trying to use external noise to quiet the noise inside of us. 
And what we end up doing in those moments is we compound the issue. Because now we're not just, we're not just in a moment of inner noise. We've now added exterior, external noise to it. And that becomes harder for us to shut off. And then we wonder why we never hear from God. We turn up the noise in and around us constantly, and then we imagine somehow that we can just turn it all off and hear from God like that. It doesn't work that way, my friends. It doesn't work like that. You see, silence and solitude, they are both disciplines. You know what that means? It means that it takes practice. It means that it takes work. It means that it doesn't just happen when we say go or snap our fingers. We've got to develop these habits. We've got to develop these habits, and the habits don't form in an instant, but over time. And so, Pastor, what are you suggesting for us today? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Simply, I'm asking you to find your Aramos and make time to get alone with God daily. Find your Aramos and get alone in some silence with God daily. Turn down the noise and listen for his voice. Not in a time where you offer up all of your requests, but a time where you sit in silence. And you start where you are. I know this is a big ask. For many of us, this seems very foreign. In fact, I'm sure I'll hear from somebody saying, well, this is, this is a, 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 an extra biblical idea. Some people imagine that uh, especially as we've been in Pentecostal circles, that the only way to Jesus is through expressive things. Can I just tell you that silence and solitude is how Jesus lived his life. And slowing down and sitting in silence, there's nothing wrong with it. In fact, you will find that it is life for your soul. It is rest for your soul. And if you're not doing it and you feel hurried, that might be why. And as with all four parts of this sermon series, we get to choose. We can choose to ignore it. Go about our days like we've always done. Or, and I would suggest maybe this is the better way, if I do say so myself, we can take up the challenge. We can, we can step fully into this journey of living our life living our best life, and being fully on the journey from where we are to where God wants us to be. The choice is ours. Some of you will walk out of here and you won't even remember what I preached about today. I encourage you to write down two words, silence and solitude. Write them on your calendar. Write them somewhere where you'll see them when you get home. Write it somewhere where you will uh, interact with it. Post a note in your car. I always think it's a great thing. But take the next step. And listen, your next step is probably not my next step. And my next step is not your next step. And that's okay. Just take your next step. Just take your next step. Whatever it may be. It may not be an hour each day with Jesus. Just find your five minutes. It may not be hiking through the forest. Just find time to sit in your car in the driveway when you get home from work and just be in silence with God before you walk into the chaos of home. And listen, I just want to close. Worship team, why don't you come on back up? Because I want to give you some definitive things here. If, if we will take up the challenge, church, if we'll take up this challenge to find more silence, more solitude in our days, here are some things, here are some things that I believe will happen for all of us. First, we will find our quiet places. I believe that will happen. It may be in a park down the street. It may be parking on the street. <laughs> a reading nook at home. A morning routine that begins before the little ones wake up. But we find our quiet places, and we get away to the place where it's just peace and silence. I think another thing that could very well happen for us is that we begin to take our time. Not living that hurried lifestyle. Maybe it's not a full hour again, but we're there long enough to decompress. 
to decompress from all of the noise and the traffic and the stress and the non-stop stimulation of modern society. We just take our time. Another thing I believe can happen is that we slow down. We breathe. We come back to the present. So many days I'm either living in the past or I'm living in the future. And when I do that, I'm not fully present, am I? We all need to slow down. And we need to be present. Present with those we love. Present with God. Because those are the moments that matter. Another thing I believe that will happen is that we will start to feel. Maybe it's been a long time since you actually felt something. And in the beginning, I'm sure we'll feel the gamut of emotions. Not just joy and gratitude and celebration and restfulness, but also sadness and doubt and anger and anxiety. But we weren't made to be machines, everybody. We weren't made to push aside all of the feelings and emotions that we have. We are made to feel. And when we stuff those feelings, very dangerous things happen in our lives. And when we slow down and we become in touch with the way we feel about life, what happens is that our feelings allow us to be able to connect with the feelings of others. I cannot deal well with your feelings of sadness if I myself have never felt the feeling of sadness. I cannot feel with you your grief if I myself have never grieved. I cannot celebrate the joy in your life if I've never felt joy in my life. Silence and solitude allows us the space to feel the feelings that are so important to our existence and our relationships. What will also happen is that we begin to face things, the good, the bad, and yes, the ugly in our own hearts, our worry, our depression, our hope, our desire for God, our lack of desire for God, our sense of God's presence, our sense of God's absence. We'll face our fantasies coupled with our realities. We'll face the lies that we believe and the truth that we come home to. We'll face our motivations and our addictions. We'll face those coping mechanisms that we reach for just to make it through the week. Silence and solitude puts us in a position that we are exposed, and sometimes painfully so. But rather than leaking those onto the people we love the most, how about we expose it in a safe place in front of the Father's love and in His peace. And then the last thing that I believe will happen if we take up the challenge. In our ears, in our ears, we will begin to sense the voice of God cutting through all of the other voices. And we'll see all of those other voices slowly fade to a deafening roar of silence. And in that quiet place, in that quiet place, we will hear God speak his love over us. We will hear God speak our identities and our callings into being. We will hear God speak his perspective on life and our good places in it. We will find in our silence and solitude God's will, his good pleasing and perfect will and so I don't know about you but I'm in for it I'm here for it silence and solitude it is my next step finding time 
in the Aramos, whatever that looks like for me, but finding time in that quiet place where I can sit in silence and it not be awkward, but it be fulfilling. It's not lonely, but somehow it lets me know that I'm not alone. It's not emptying, but when I walk away, I walk with a greater sense of fulfillment and calling and purpose for my life. Stand to your feet with me if you would. Father, we thank you that, Lord, that even in silence, even in silence, even when we stop working, that your name can be glorified. That it's not in the doing, it's not in the doing that we necessarily glorify you at all times. That, that actually in our rest, in our peace, in our silence, and in our solitude, we make space for you to do what you can do. And for so many of us, we have to stop the hurry. We have to stop being so busy. We have to find our time of silence and solitude in our lives, in our everyday, so that we can follow you in bigger and better ways. So Lord, forgive us for the times that we've hurried past your blessing. We've hurried through a relationship, that we've hurried life to the next day and the next year and the next 10 years just to get to some point. Lord, help us to be present in the moment now. And Lord, as we sit in silence and in the Aramos, may we meet you there. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship him together.
and in awe of the one who gave it all. And I'll stand in my soul, Lord, to you surrendered all. I am, he's yours. Come on, sing it again. I'll stand. So I'll stand with all. today he is he is ours and we are his hallelujah Jesus I'm gonna be checking up on y'all this week silence and solitude and listen we started the hope project last week and if you didn't get a chance to sign up for that we've had many of you sign up so thanks for being along in that journey uh, but the hope project something we're beginning this isn't going away it wasn't just an Easter thing but if you want more hope in your life uh, sign up for that because silence and solitude guess what it's going to be a part of it and so we're, we're sending out emails giving some ideas some instructions and all of that so you can scan the QR code Jeff can you just leave that up maybe at the end of service so people can have time to do that and uh, sign up for that it will be meaningful I'm sure sure of it. Also want to mention that we have a Get Connected counter out in the lobby. It's that orange counter. Uh, Miss Tanya Freestone is there most Sundays. And if you want to sign up for baby dedications or you have, uh, you have questions about the church, maybe the lady soiree, stop at that counter there. It's great information. She knows everything. So if you got deep theological questions, go see Tanya. You know, okay, no. But Tanya's great if you know her, you love her. Uh, but stop out there. At least say hello. She would appreciate that. Sometimes it's lonely out there. She's right next to the free coffee. So, uh, so don't just walk up and grab a coffee. Say hello to Tanya. But if you have questions, want to sign up, that's where you're going to do it at, uh, in addition to all the online ways. Here's the blessing if you'll receive it. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be ever so gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace as you enter into more and more silence and solitude. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great rest of your Sunday.